giving the monkey a gun, this giving me uh... So, I will try and keep my own time as well. So, my name's Mark. I'm a recovering civil servant. <laughs> I haven't opened a spreadsheet or looked at any statistics since the 20th of July, 2015, and for that I am eternally grateful. <laughs> um, I, I was going to use a PowerPoint, but then again, I'd, then I'd start lying, you know. Um, because if I've got PowerPoint, I'm not having a disrespect to anybody who is subsequently going to use PowerPoint. Um, but the tendency is, having been in this business for a long, long time, I came into the world of uh, addiction, in inverted commas, alcoholism, in inverted commas. If I use addiction or alcoholism and it offends you, then think your own term. Uh, I'm trying to use substance use disorder which I agree is the correct term to be absolutely specific about the thing, but I'm afraid I'm a bit old-fashioned and I'll drift back into addiction and alcoholism probably, so I apologise up front for that. Um, as Tony said, I've never got on well with numbers um, at all, really, uh, probably because it's just not how I work, you know what I mean? I know, I, know I, I absolutely appreciate that there is a need for numbers. You know, this industry that some of us have worked in for a long, long time has been very generously um, rewarded for its efforts. Um, I wrote an article, well, contributed to a paper a couple of years ago where we tried to track the investment in drug and alcohol and treatments in England. And it's difficult to find another area of health and social care that's attracted such funding so quickly. It went from, when I, when I first came in, um, I always want to get the violin out at that point, you know, when I, when we had nothing, you know, uh, but we had very little. Uh, when I worked at Lifeline as a volunteer and at the Bridge Project in Bradford, uh, way back in this distance of time, 1981, sure my age now. Um, but we didn't have much money at all. And then I remember we got the Central Funding Initiative, which was from memory about £19 million. And it felt like everybody had won the lottery. £19 million, that's about 1983, on the back of the brown powder heroin epidemic. Uh, and then it went in a 30-year period, probably less than a 30-year period, to a billion. Yeah, so it went from 19 million in government funding terms is pretty much zero, really. Um, and it went from almost zero, a little bit over zero, to one billion pounds, there or thereabouts, in a 30-year period, which is a, a phenomenal investment. Um, so that's a lot of money, and that money will demand that there are numbers, targets attached, performance management metrics to assure that there's a cost-benefit analysis, analyses can be done, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but that's as far as it went for me with the numbers, really. Um, because I started, I, first, I never even heard the term recovery until June 90, I've been trying to date, this must be a thing about age, I can remember what happened 30 odd years ago, but I don't know where I've left my watch, you know. Um, but I, June 1995 was my first experience uh, of a, me, a mutual aid meeting. And uh, I became then um, variously engaged, professionally and, uh, and personally, uh, with this thing that we call recovery um, to this day. But I developed from the, although it's a, I won't bore you with my personal story, but basically, um, it's been a long and circuitous journey. But the one thing that always stood in stark contrast to me is what I did for a living, uh, working in treatment, professional, medical, clinical treatment services. So I've worked in, I've worked in research, I've worked in policy, and I've worked in practice. Um, and I were all, I've always been acutely aware of the difference between the world of professional, medical, clinical treatment and the world of indigenous, organic recovery, yeah? Where one alcoholic comes to help another alcoholic or one addict comes to help another addict and that is, in my personal opinion, I can say all this now, I'm, st I'm still nervous now because I'm, I'm not a civil servant anymore, but and I'm trying to, de but I've managed to get rid of the tie and it's not a matching suit and I've got brown shoes, so I'm being detoxified from, uh, from the, the need to wear a suit and a, and a tie. But, a long-winded preamble, and I'm trying very hard not to, not, to, not to have a go at anybody or anything. People's places and things are not my concern anymore, yeah? Uh, but, <laughs> however, yeah. Uh, no, it, you see, 
My observation is that everything that's good about recovery is authentic. So if I had to choose one word, you know the word diagrams you get, you know, one, one, one word for me, it would be authentic or authenticity. Uh, and everything that's not so good about the world of addiction treatment and all that stuff is not authentic. And if it's not authentic, it's snide. So if it's not a real Stone Island jacket, it's snide, man. You know, uh, and I would no longer, you know, I would no more be seen in a snide. Well, I'm too old for Stone Island or for any, you know. But if, but if I were wearing one, I'd wear a real one. You know what I mean? I wouldn't have a snide one. But then that's not to have a pop at anybody who gets great pleasure from going to certain parts of North Manchester and acquiring <laughs> labelled, you know. That said, but if it's fake and if it's not honest, then is it a lie? Is my this is I'm, now I'd have this conversation even if I'm in a room on my own though. So, yeah, so thanks for coming. Yeah. <laughs> this is an internal dialogue played out in front of hundred people. So if it, if it, is it a lie? And then of course it, that takes me back to that great quote about statistics: lies, damn lies, and statistics. Um, because, and again I apologise. I'm not going to go to anybody in this room, but there is a tendency within that, within this world that I've inhabited until the 20th of July 2015, from the 15th of September 1985. How's that for a memory? Yeah. <laughs> uh, there is a tendency to disregard anything that can't be proven with numbers. Yeah, that's why I choose to put numbers in my room 101 at that conference in Sheffield. If you can't prove it to the satisfaction of statisticians and people who, who, who have a fetish, I would go as far as to say, have a fetish for evidence-based practice that is grounded in numbers. If you can't put a number on it, you don't exist. If we can't measure it, we don't, you don't exist. So anybody in this room uh, who's in recovery, the, the, the danger is you, we, are statistically insignificant. You know, we probably don't measure uh, that much and therefore are unlikely um, to attract a whole, as much funding as things that can, somebody who can spread, who can, you know, look at the size of that spreadsheet, you know, look at them numbers. What's it? Where's the lady? I don't know why I do that, Courtney. It's just you saying it. <laughs> anyway. There's a, I've, I did a talk a couple of month, uh, last month on July the 12th called the Helen Lester Memorial Lecture. And the reason why I've changed these notes is you can look at the Helen Lester Memorial Lecture at your leisure via the favour website under the news section. And it'll be on but before the end of today where I go into a lot more of this stuff about, stuff about addiction around trauma and mutual aid and spirituality and all that stuff. So I'm going to try and steer away from that to make the best use of the next 20 minutes. Uh, okay, for 20 minutes, yeah. Yeah, so I'll get, us, I'll get us back on time, guaranteed to finish at 10.50 for, for Anne-Marie. But I, in 1990, I, heard a, I went to a conference in Liverpool and there was a guy called Ernest Drucker, I think he's still arrive, alive. He was, from memory, an epidemiologist from New York. And he came out with a quote. Well, I think he came out with a quote, but um, I was tired and emotional at the time. Um, and he... He said something like, uh, so I apologize, and if he doesn't claim it quickly, I'll, then I'll claim it as mine. <laughs> yeah. But he said something like, we need, to re we need to be able to taste the salty tears of the human beings who lie, whose lives lie behind the bald statistics of epidemiology. In other words, behind those anonymous spreadsheets and performance management metrics is somebody's mum somebody's dad, somebody's husband, somebody's son, somebody's daughter. They are people. Those dots on a spreadsheet, those people behind that bar chart, inside that histogram, underneath that pie chart, on that forest plot, you know, they are people. People who cry real salty tears, yeah? Uh, and we lose that connection at our peril. And that's my fear, is that we, we lose the connection. But, ever the optimist, uh, I know from knowing people in this room and it'll be on the walk tomorrow that we've got enough stories amongst us to counter that kind of therapeutic nihilism, if you will, uh, that says, well, you know, this is a chronic condition, it lasts a long time. 
It's characterised by relapse. Yeah, it is. It, you know, people do relapse tragically. Some get back, some don't. And therefore, it's a chronic relapsing condition. Uh, and like other chronic relapsing conditions, there is no cure. Maybe there isn't. Uh, and therefore, it gets very pessimistic in, in, in too many clinical medical treatment services. But we know in this room that there is a solution, that there is a way of, of recovering uh, from this seemingly hopeless state of mind, body and, dare I say, spirit. Yeah? Uh, and it's real. But because we don't register often on the, uh, in, the, in the corridors of power all too often, then the danger is that we don't have a voice. But of course, we do have a voice and, uh, and we'll certainly be making it heard. I just want to know, we, it's called the academic perspective, but I don't really want to go into a great academic treatise on the history of ethnography and anthropology and blah, 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 because we've got a real academic coming up later on. And I'm a black artist anyway, so, you know. Uh, but I have read a lot of books, you know, I have read a lot of books. And I've always been drawn to ethnography. So what, what on earth is it? So basically, when we tell stories, yeah, to each other, um, we are basically engaged. Oh, well, so tomorrow, in fact, Liam at this presentation, I don't know what he's going to say, but he's going to talk about, um, you know, the, the ethnography of, of, of activism, you know, and, acti and basically, what we, when we walk tomorrow, uh, however many thousand people will come together and they will walk along the prom, whatever we're going to do, um, and there will be conversations taking place in a natural setting. And what anthropology, which I would argue is the kind of parent of ethnography, is basically what Ernie Drucker said, tasting the salty tears, getting alongside people, what's your experience, yeah? Not looking at the world through a spreadsheet or through a performance management metric, but actually getting into the world and living it. And if we don't do that, then we run the, we, we, we run the risk of never really understanding what on earth we're doing. I'll give you one, well, not one, I'll give you a few examples. John Booth Davis uh, wrote a book called The Myth of Addiction. And it's a fantastic book. It's one of the, you know, that Desert Island Discs, even Desert Island Addiction books, that's one of them. The Myth of Addiction. Controversial title. But what he it's got, it uses discourse analysis. Well, basically, and it's not technically an ethnography because it's about conversations, but it's an illustrative example of how things can appear very different. Very briefly, what he did, he administered a questionnaire to a number, let's call it 20, because I can't remember. He, he asked 20 heroin addicts from memory into Gla in Glasgow to come into his office and to be, have a questionnaire administered to them by Professor John Booth Davis. Don't know he had a dicky boat on or whatever, but he was certainly sat, probably sat behind a desk, yeah? Yeah, so how did, and he asked them 20 questions, and they answered, right, bosh. And then what he, when he's doing a presentation, he you know, always said, and then I put it onto a spreadsheet, and then I put it with overhead projectors in them. Days. Then I put it onto an overhead projector, and I made a pie chart. Science. It's science now. 20 conversations of science, yeah? And, if you're not, and then he said, just a bit, just for a... Then what he did, he, got, he took the same 20 questions, yeah? And it might have been, don't quote me on the 20, but the same kind of questions, and he asked a young qualitative researcher, a younger ethnographer type, to go to those 20 people, but not bring them into the University of Strathclyde office to see a professor, a doctor, on the, in the gaff, and where they live, on their territory, where they determine what time you're coming, how many, how many hobnobs were dunking. You know, they, well, you basically you go into the, and they ask the same 20 questions, and guess what? Fundamentally different answer. <laughs> Fundamentally different answer about why they did what they were doing. Why would that happen? Why would it be? Is, not, is a heroin addict not a heroin addict not a heroin addict? No, they're not. They look very, it's like, it's like in uh, triangulation. You know, if you look at a hill from one angle, it looks like one thing. You look at it from another, it looks slightly different. You look at a, a triangle. If you, and one of the things he said, there's one, it, it, I'm paraphrasing now, but he, I love the quote he said. It appears there is one very clear way of never getting methadone, asking for it. Never, ever, ever ask for methadone if that's what you want. <laughs> Suggest that it might be that you have heard, Doctor, on occasions people might benefit slightly from this, is it green liquid method? I, I, one in one, I, 30, 60, 120 milligrams or so. 
That'll be methadone. I can help you. Because then what you've done is you've, been, you've become the patient that allows the doctor to help you. But never, ever, ever go in and, and tell the truth. Doctor, it's all on top, mate. I've just been nicked again. I'm once again standing before the magistrates of the great cheese thief of Blackpool. Once again, I've been caught liberating Mac 3 razors, bacon, <laughs> steak, selling it in Weatherspoons at 0901 <laughs> to a rapacious audience, all too hungry for a cheap steak, yeah, in order that I can replenish myself with a bag of heroin and a, t and a bottle of white cider that's never seen an apple. Yeah? But you can't do that. You can't walk into a doctor and say, it's all on top, mate, I don't know. I'm gonna, I've been nicked again. I've got the arse hanging out of my pants. Do you know what, mate? Just give us 100 mils of methadone for a, a day, for a week, will you? Just till I get it all sorted. You're not going to get it, are you? But that's the truth. That's, the, that's a truth, isn't it? But no, don't do that. Learn what you need to say, yeah? So if you are not honest, and I said the key thing for me is authenticity, if that conversation is not authentic and it's not honest, how can change, how can genuine change ever happen? And then we wonder why. And I feel sorry for people still work. I, I managed a methadone clinic in Manchester for a bit. And it's, it, it can be quite, quite soul destroying because you're engaged in this game. You're engaged in a game. I said, she said, she said, 80 mils, 100 mils, call it 90, done. No. All right, pick up once a week, once a day, twice a week, three times a week, done. <laughs> I'm having it. Now we've got it going on. Yeah. You know, and then by the time you've done that, filled your NDTMS form, form and your TOPS form, it's time, it's time for Jeremy Kyle. But uh, anyway, so that had a big influence on me about authenticity and what, what really is the truth, you know. And of course, what ethnography does, it goes right to the truth, yeah. And then a whole world opened up. So I, when I, in 19... 80, ooh, 1984, I got a job as a researcher on a project called Young People and Heroin in the North of England. And I got the North West, talk about audacious ethnography, you know, like, what's my job? Your job is to go out to heroin addicts around Greater Manchester, Merseyside, South Yorkshire, Lancashire, and find out what's going on. That's it. No questionnaires, no spreadsheets, no nothing. Just go and hang out with them and see what's happening, yeah? Well, great, you know. Um, so that's what I did. And we didn't, and so we read, you know, when you're doing a research project, you do the literature review, do, read all the literature, all the, what all the numbers are, and all that, and it made no sense to me whatsoever. Because I'm thinking, hang on a bit now. So then, so I'm living on this council, I'm, I was born on a, in a paper shop on a council estate, violin time, yeah, that, that was regularly a victim of uh, heroin addicts, you know, for burglary and theft, and you know, even then, they weren't that good at it, you know, it were, um, you know, they were never going to be on uh, Britain's best criminals. Because, you know, you, those of you will know, like, if you've got a heroin addict living at number 17, once they've sold all their own gear and their own boiler and burnt all their own wire off in the kitchen, then it's 15 and 13 that are getting it next, you know, or 17, 13 and 19, you know, so you don't need to be a great criminal mastermind to work out that the, you know, a particular crime epidemic is down to a relatively uh, vociferous bunch of heroin addicts. So, but that's my background's criminology, so I, I, uh, I discovered that. <laughs> Lo and behold, I discovered that. But um, it didn't make any sense, you know, because if you'd have read the literature, you would have thought people are taking heroin, uh, they're pulling the curtains, they're, they're riddled with existential angst, which they may well be, uh, and they're not, they're not engaged in anything. They're withdrawing, man, they're withdrawing, they're turning off. Heroin addicts are withdrawing. They didn't like the withdrawing to me, they were withdrawing physically. <laughs> But they didn't look like they'd retreated in Mertonian sociological terms. They, they didn't look like they'd retreated. They looked like they were busy. And, but why is it that every year they go and score and talk to everybody behind the back? He's here, yeah, come on, come on, come on. Well, and then when they've got it, right, yeah. why? That didn't look like retreat. That looked like busy, busy, busy. They looked like they were going to work, grafting. Yeah, it didn't look like they were going to work. They were busy. They certainly had meaning and purpose. <laughs> you know what I mean? They knew exactly what they were doing. Yeah, uh, and they were doing it now. Yeah. So then I thought, well, this, this, and so I used to go back to university and say, it don't make no sense to me any of this. You know, they're meant to be withdrawing. The, you know, the wandering lonely as a cloud, as cold ridge of worlds with a Byron and all that, and they've embraced opiates to deal with their ex existential. They look busy to me. They look busy grafting and scoring, and then. 
we found a paper. It was like finding gold at the Institute for the Study of Drug Dependence from 1969. Preble and Casey taking care of business, an ethnographic account of the heroin user's life on the street. And it was, it was just like that, boom, that's what it is. That's exactly what it is. And it was a guy, again, I think in New York, who spent time with people and said, the thing about heroin addiction, and this is what we were researching at the time, is that it gives you something to do. It fills time. There is no, and, and that said, us on this journey then, back to 1930s Austria, and another ethnographic study by a woman uh, called Marie Yehorda, the Marienthal Cotton Studies, where she, an ethnographer looking at the impact of mass unemployment, the first experience of mass unemployment in industrial capitalism, yeah, 1930s, arguably the first experience. And she found that phenomenon of men leaving the home in the morning, they'd been sacked, there were no job, but they left their home in the morning with the sandwiches and sat in the park nine till five then went home, yeah, because their lives had been structured by the factory and time discipline. When we all, I'm not saying that we had great fun before the factories and before we were all sent into the, off the land and into the factories, but at least we didn't bother with clocks. <laughs> time, careful now, this, is a real, this could really bore you to tears, but time, pursue this at your leisure, is a relatively modern concept, nine to five, and all that shifts, six two, two ten, night. Well, what, what happened to just, it's November, I'm getting up at 10 o'clock, <laughs> and I'm going to bed when it's dark, you know what I mean? And I'm getting up when the chickens get up, I'm going to sleep when they go to sleep. Our, is it natural for our lives to be run by industrial capitalism, blah, blah, blah? Well, whether, whether it is or it isn't, her, the life of the unemployed heroin addict fits like a glove inside that time vacuum, yeah? Because once you've got an habit, you're not waking up in the morning thinking, hi, Friday. 10.46. Bloody hell. What are we going to do? No, no. <gasps> Up. Yeah, yeah. Now, who might have left a laptop on that car park? Which sat nav shall we be? Or, oh, while we're waiting, let's make our way to the nearest supermarket and liberate some cheese. <laughs> or some bacon. Bacon's always a good one for a bag. Yeah. Big thing of bacon. Or, uh, you know, and on and on and on. So, up, out, first up, best dressed, scoring, grafting, scoring, grafting, scoring, grafting, scoring. Whew, stop. Whew. Grafting, scoring, grafting, scoring, grafting, scoring, stop. And then the next paper from Messrs. Preble and Casey, which is the one I'm nearly going to finish with, is the subsequent observation of what happened when you applied methadone maintenance to that scenario. Yeah? What happened? So here we've got busy, 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 lots of victims of crime, grafting, scoring, grafting, scoring. Put them all on methadone. And a good idea. No, I'm, you know, there's a lot of working class victims of working class addicts. So put them all on methadone. Now, the, the hope was put them on methadone. They won't need to do all the grafting and scoring to buy the heroin because we're giving them methadone as much as they want. Bucket and a straw if you want. There you go. Have as much as you want. All we ask is you keep your grubby hands off that bacon. Yeah? <laughs> And my sat nav in his house. Yeah, that's the deal. That's, oh, and by the way, don't show your injection equipment, will you, and start spreading AIDS and stuff like that? Yeah, so we'll give you needles for that. So stop thieving and stop spreading blood-borne viruses, and we'll put some money into it. Fear-driven funding. Yeah, fear-driven funding. Now, did it happen? Did those heroin addicts, when they were given the methadone, say, oh, I think I'll save up and send my kids to college? I've got all this money now, my benefits, don't need to spend it all on that. I think I'll, uh, I think I'll save up for uh, an Encyclopedia Britannica. <laughs> you know? They didn't. They didn't. They bought Thunderbird wine. <laughs> the 1977 New, New York equivalent of white cider. Yeah, that's what they bought, Thunderbird wine. So the paper, their paper is called Methadone, Wine and Welfare. So what happened is we turned unemployed heroin addicts into unemployed methadone addicts, yeah? And they stayed on benefits, they didn't go to work, blah, 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 methadone, wine and welfare. And my observation of the last number of years is that we, our version of methadone, wine and welfare in New York in 1977 
is methadone, booze, benzos, benefits, and Jeremy Kyle. <laughs> living the dream. Yeah, that's me living the dream. Yeah, that's it. Now, if we're to get beyond that and to get something um, that's more authentic, I would argue that we've got in our world now probably. Well, I just want to say one thing about. If you haven't ever read that, I always say this. Should be on the corner, a year in the life of an inner city neighbourhood. The, for my money, one of the, one of the best books ever written about all this stuff, man. Yeah, the corner, a year in the life of an inner city neighbourhood. It was what gave us the wire, the seminal TV series, the wire in the hood, mother. Yeah. I cut the corner, a year in the life of an inner city neighbourhood. It's our, it's our f present and it's our future, yeah? But for me, the best ethnographic study of this condition that, that we are trying to address today is the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. Because that is the story of 100 men and women who recovered, not recovering, by the way, footnote, who recovered from a seem seemingly, therefore it might be, but it's not, from a seemingly hopeless state of mind, body, and I would add spirit. And that book, published in 1939, every time I read it now, seems more and more relevant as an ethnography par excellence. Maybe worth mentioning in that context, only one other book, and that would be the Bible. Thank you very much. <laughs>